Amen. Well, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, uh, we are going to read Psalm 12. Uh, Psalm number 12. It says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said with our tongue we will prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. All right, praise the Lord for his word. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter one. Uh, we're going to be in uh, the really, really the beginning part of the passage here or of the chapter. Um, we had one kind of opening message uh, going over Second Timothy uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're going to continue on with our study uh, through Second Timothy. Now we know again that today is Father's Day, right? Today is Father's Day. When we think about fathers. You know, what do you think about? You think about someone who protects, who cares for, who leads the family. Uh, fatherhood really carries with it this, this great responsibility. It's a very big responsibility. And one of those responsibilities is raising children. Now, I can tell you from experience that that is a, that is a massive responsibility. It's, it's a big deal, not something that should be taken lightly. But even as Christians, as a Christian father, it's an even bigger responsibility. Because not only are we as fathers responsible for raising them to be functioning in, functioning in adults, that's, that's a tough enough job as it is, but we're also responsible for passing on the truth of Jesus Christ to our children. We're responsible for, for teaching them the gospel, for teaching them the truth of God's word, for, for not just raising them as functional good adults, but raising them as, as good Christians who follow the Lord. Now it's scary, the day and age that we live in, where... We're constantly being bombarded with information. We're constantly being bombarded with, with what is called the truth. And so if we don't teach our children, and if we don't teach others the truth of Jesus Christ, if we don't teach them the truth of God's word, the world, as we know, is more than happy to fill in that gap and, and to teach children their depravity, to teach them their sin, uh, uh, to teach them how to, to depart from God's word and depart from the Lord. We see this all the time nowadays. I mean, this is June, okay? It's Pride Month, right? It's, it's all over the place. There's, there's all kinds of, of sin and, and depravity that is, that is contrary to God's word that's being thrown around and tossed around and even taught to children. Listen, Christians in this room, we cannot, we cannot outsource teaching the next generation the truth. We can't outsource that to the world. We can't. They're... they're, they're not only would they not do a good job, they would do the opposite of what, you know, we would have them to. And so what we're going to see here in our passage is that parents, not just parents though, church, you are responsible for passing the truth of Jesus Christ on to the next generation. And so that's what we're going to look at here in our passage. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 through 5. This is Paul's introduction here. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. That in thee also. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for this time. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the help that they are to me. Um, thank you for... Uh, the opportunity to get into your word. 
Thank you for um, bringing our, our children into our lives, Lord, and I pray that you would help me as a father, that you would help us as a church uh, pass on the truth of your word to them, pass on the truth of your word to others, to um, teach others the truth of the gospel, to teach the others the truth of God's word, to disciple them, uh, to raise them up for you, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, give us courage and strength and boldness to do that, that you would fill us with your spirit here this morning, that we would be walk away from here today just... just uh, um, just ready to, to teach and to lead others to you. And Lord, just inspire us with your spirit, Lord, to do that and to, to pass on the truth of your word to, to the next generation. And we love you so much. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for sending him to pay my penalty, my sin debt, and our sin debt, Lord. Thank you so much. And again, help us to teach others about that as well. And we pray all these things and just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in our passage, again, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we, we talked about this quite a bit before, but we see that Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle, is writing this letter to Timothy. Now we can tell in verses 1 through 4 here that, that Paul cares a lot about Timothy. He cares about Timothy a great deal, and he hopes to see him soon. He says, I'm mindful of his tears, right? He's remembering what most people think is that uh, uh, Paul is remembering uh, parting away from Timothy and leaving him in Ephesus, and that when they parted, um, that Timothy... Timothy was crying because, um, or had tears because of that separation that they were going to have, and 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 you know, um, um, which is which is natural. And so Paul remembers that, and Paul cares about Timothy. Paul wants to see him. He can't wait to see him uh, if he gets a chance because it would bring him joy. And he thanks God so much for uh, 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 Timothy's faith, and he has joy whenever he remembers Timothy's faith. And he says it's an unfeigned faith. Uh, well, that means it's authentic. That means it's real. That means. Uh, uh, Timothy has that faith himself and a very real faith in Christ. And this faith that brings Paul so much joy in Timothy, his, 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 uh, uh, um, um, his um, you know, this person who Paul has been mentoring, who Paul has been teaching, his, his disciple really, uh, the faith that Timothy has, where does that come from? Where did he get it from? How was it passed on to him? Well, somebody passed it on to him. And I think if we see here in our passage who passed that faith on to him, then we can also see where our responsibility lies to pass that faith on to others. And so what do we see here in our passage? Well, first of all, Timothy received the faith from his family. He received it from his family. Now, uh, if you look at Acts chapter 14, you get kind of Timothy's uh, backstory. Acts chapter 14, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, so Acts chapter 14, we see that Timothy was from the city of Lystra. Okay, Timothy was from the city of Lystra. That's kind of in the Galatia province. And so when Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, Lystra and the church in Lystra was probably included in that letter when it was passed around. But Paul visited Lystra on his first and his second missionary journey. So Paul the apostle uh, was converted on the road to Damascus and then God sent him out uh, to go and, and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And so Paul went on one missionary journey um, to preach the gospel. He went on a second one to confirm the churches. And Paul visited the city of Lystra on his first and his second missionary journeys. Now we get an account of his first visit to Lystra in Acts chapter 14. Let's just go ahead and read. Uh, we'll read uh, 1 through 22. I know it's a little bit long, but it uh, gives us some good backstory here about what happened where Timothy came from. It says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also the Greeks believed. Um, but the unbelieving, well, let's just skip down to verse six, save us some time here. Uh, it says they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby. So they had some trouble there in Iconium. So they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of, of Lycaonia and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there a certain man at Lystra, impotent at his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Ly Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands into the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes, and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, Sirs, 
Why do you these things? We are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice to them. And then there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them in, to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So, Imagine this picture, right? Paul and Barnabas are in this city. They're preaching the gospel. And then this lame man who has never walked was healed by God through Paul. And then this whole city comes to Paul and Barnabas and they call them uh, Jupiter and Mercury. And they start making sacrifices to them in the name of those gods. And then Paul and Barnabas were like, no, no, stop it. Don't do that. And they, they point them to Christ. They said, we're just men. We're just people. Uh, 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 Jesus Christ is the one who healed him. And they pointed them to Christ. And then the, the Judaizers from, from Antioch, the Jewish people, they came and they, they, they stirred up the whole city against them. And they, they, they got the whole city. They're like, see, they're going against your gods and et cetera, et cetera. And so then the people were, were stirred up against them and, and, and attacked them. And they stoned Paul and they drug him out of the city and threw him out and left him for dead outside the city. And then all the disciples, all the Christians were sitting around Paul. And I, I, I can just picture it now, the circle around Paul. All of a sudden he stands up and they're like, whoa, you know, God healed Paul. And then he got up and they went to the city of Derby. And then Paul came back. He's like, I'm not done here in Lystra. He came back to Lystra, continued preaching the gospel and confirming the churches. What a, what a wonderful, awesome story. That's, that's amazing what happened there. Now you can say, okay, well, what about Timothy? Where does he come in? I thought he was from Lystra. Well, we hear about Timothy and Paul's second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16. Um, and I know this seems like a lot, but if you follow along, I think it will, will help um, as we kind of put together Timothy's story here. So, so Paul and Barnabas preach the gospel in Lystra. They get attacked, they get stoned, they get thrown out. They come back, they confirm the churches, they preach the gospel some more. And then in Acts chapter 16, um, Paul is now on his second missionary journey. He doesn't have Barnabas this time with him. Uh, I think he took Silas with him as, when they, you know, they split up, but that's a whole different story. But Paul is coming back through Lystra to confirm the churches, to help them, to preach to them. And and so look at chapter 16 and verse 1. It says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. So this is Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, uh, Jewess, and believed. So his mother was a Christian Jew, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So Timothy was well reported of. He had a good reputation. The people loved him there. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep and that were ordained to the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So we see Timothy where he comes into the picture now. So Paul is going back through the regions uh, to confirm the churches, to preach to them. And then he comes to Lystra. And when he comes to the city uh, where he, he you know, had that trouble before but still preached the gospel, he finds Timothy. And Timothy is this young man who is well reported of in the church. So I can just imagine people in the church being like, Paul, you should hear about this, this young guy, Timothy. Man, he's, he, he loves the Lord. He, he can preach. He can speak the word. Um, he's, he's helping us in the church. Man, he, he is great. Timothy is awesome. Um, of course, glory to be to God, right? But, but Timothy is, is, is great, and he's well reported of, uh, reported of. And so Paul was like, yeah, that sounds great. And so he met up with Timothy, and he took him under his wing and kind of mentored him and brought him with him along for the rest of his missionary journey. And so Timothy went with him as they passed through the other churches. And so you get this picture of Timothy's story, right? Um, and you see how he kind of, how he did receive the gospel, how he received the truth of God's word. What we see happen is that Paul, the apostle, preached the gospel in his city. And then we see from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, that then his mother and his grandmother received the gospel from Paul and then passed it on to Timothy, right? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 
It's exactly what uh, Paul says there. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. So first the faith was in his grandmother and his mother Eunice. And then he said, and I'm persuaded in thee also. So what a, what a cool story of how Timothy got saved, right? Paul preached the gospel. His grandmother heard it. His mother heard it. And then they passed it on to him. And so we see what we see here as we put this picture together, as we put this story together, we see the very important role that family has when passing on the gospel and the truth to the next generation. See, Timothy was taught this truth by his mother and his grandmother. Now we know, again, that families, parents, grandparents, siblings, right? Pe uh, people in our family, we are responsible for passing on the truth of the gospel to the next generation. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, we see that fathers are instructed to raise up their children with nurture and admonition of the Lord, right? To, to raise them up. That means to teach them, to, to help them as, as they are raised, as they grow. Uh, but not just, not just in general, but also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're to feed them more, the word of God. We're to, to feed them the teaching of, of the truth of Jesus Christ. We're to give them admonition, which means encouragement, right? To encourage them in the Lord, to uh, build them up in the Lord. That's, that's, that's the role that fathers are to play. Is the, the Israelites um, in, in the Old Testament, we see lots of examples where the Israelites were to pass on to the next generation the good news of what God has done for them and their children. Just a couple examples. Exodus chapter 12. We looked at this when studying the Lord's Supper. Um, but Exodus chapter 12 and verse 26, we see that the Passover, um, one of the major roles of the Passover was to pass on the truth of what happened at the Passover to their children. Um, verse 26 of Exodus chapter 12, it says, And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worship. So they were to use the Passover. Uh, the, the children were going to be like, Why are we eating this Passover? Why are we celebrating this? And it presented an opportunity to pass that truth on to their children. We also see this in Joshua when Israel entered the promised land um, and they crossed over the Jordan River. Joshua chapter 4, um, Israel uh, crossed over the Jordan River. They were going into the promised land. They were getting ready to conquer that land and, and conquer it for the Lord. Um, Joshua chapter 4 and verse 5 says, And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of your Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and those stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So they were supposed to pick up these stones in the middle. So um, they crossed over the Jordan River, just like when they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, the waters parted. God parted the river. They crossed over on, on dry ground. And then they were told to pick up stones from the bottom of the river and take them to be a memorial memorial to pass that on to their children. And Israel was to pass on the truth of, of God helping them and, and the truth of the Lord and the law and all of that to their children. Now, the Israelites are an interesting case study when it comes to this. Because you see, as they go into the promised land, they're led by Joshua and, and they're on fire for the Lord as they go in and they take over these nations and they, they set up the promised land. They set up Israel for the Lord. But then over time, what you see, you see this in the book of Judges, you see this in the book of Kings and Samuel, um, um, but especially in Kings, right? That over time, they forgot the Lord. They turned away from him. They turned to idols. They turned to other uh, religions. They turned to other nations and they forgot the Lord. And, and, and as you read through Kings, one thing that you'll see is that mothers and fathers had a major impact on the following generations, right? A major impact on teaching their children, whether it's teaching them about idols and false gods or whether it's teaching them about the Lord. Mothers and fathers had a major impact. And we see that Israel fell apart and they, they, they got taken by their nations and God judged them because they failed to pass on this truth to their children. So families, moms and dads, grandparents, families, you 
are the primary ones responsible for teaching your children and passing on the truth of the gospel to them. I as a father, my wife as a mother, are responsible, the primary ones responsible for teaching our children and passing on the truth of Jesus Christ to them. Do not outsource, again, don't outsource the raising of your children. Don't outsource it, especially to the world. Now the church and other things that God has provided can be a help, can be a supplement, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. But you as moms and dads and caretakers and whatever your family situation is, you must decide and commit to passing on the truth of the gospel to your children. Now, you say, well, okay, our family is a little bit different than other family, other families, you know, we have a single parent home or, you know, uh, there's all kinds of different blended families, whatever it is. Families do come in all shapes and sizes. We see even with Timothy, right? It talks about how Timothy's mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek. Timothy's mother was a Christian. It seems most likely that Timothy's father was not. Um, we don't know whether his father was in the picture. We don't really hear a whole lot about him. Paul talks about the faith of his grandmother and mother, but doesn't talk about the faith of his father. So it seems like his father was a little bit maybe out of the picture, um, or at least definitely not a Christian. But his mother and his grandmother still took it upon themselves to teach Timothy this truth. So whatever your family situation is, listen, families, teach your children, pass on that truth to the next generation. Now, not only did Timothy have his mother and his grandmother to pass it on to him, but we see that there was another person who played a significant role in his life when it came to the truth of the gospel. And that person, of course, is Paul. Yes, Paul. If you look at verse number two, Paul viewed Timothy as a son. He said to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And we see that in 1 Timothy as well, that Paul views Timothy as a son. Paul was like a father to him, uh, especially in the spiritual sense, right? Timothy received the faith. He was saved as a result of Paul's missionary journeys, right? So Paul going around to the different cities and countries and preaching the gospel uh, uh, directly resulted in Timothy's salvation and him coming to Christ. But furthermore, beyond that, Paul then took it upon himself to take Timothy, right? He took him under his wing. He brought him uh, alongside him. He mentored him. He took him with him on the missionary journey uh, to help him and to teach him. And so he trained him and he taught him how to give the gospel to others. And he must have done a great, uh, have done a great job because then he also left Timothy in Ephesus to pastor the church and to teach them the truth. And that's what we see happen after Paul or after Timothy traveled with Paul. He went along with him. He, 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 he you know, sailed with him around the world, right? Um, uh, after they, he went along with Paul for quite some time, Paul left Timothy at Ephesus and he left him there to preach the truth, to pass it on to others. He was to take, right, that truth that he learned from Paul and not just keep it for himself, not just hoard it and hold on to it himself and be like, thank you, Paul, but this is mine now. No, he was to take what he learned from Paul and then to pass that on and to teach it to others. And that's what discipleship is all about, right? When we talk about discipleship, you know, in the church, when we talk about discipleship, that's what it is. It's taking the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, and then teaching it to others, teaching it to the next generation, passing it on so they can pass it on to others, and they can pass it on to others, and so on, and so on. In fact, uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 2. He said, in the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So you see how it's a, a self-generative kind of thing, right? Where it's what passing on to pass on to pass on to pass on, right? And that's what discipleship is all about. That's how the gospel is spread. That's how the gospel is taught. I know I mentioned this before, but this is a really cool thought. It all started with Jesus, right? It all started with Jesus. He came as the son of God. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He, he died on the cross for our sins. But not only did he do that, but he had a ministry on earth where he took his disciples, he took the 12 and he taught them. He had his inner circle of three. He taught them. He spent time with them. He told them the truth. Um, he taught them the truth and he passed it on to his disciples. And then what did they do? They passed it on to others and they passed it on to others and they passed it on to others down throughout the generations and if we could, I know we can't, but if we could like look at every stop along the way, it would be awesome to be able to trace back you hearing the gospel 
could be traced back all the way back to Jesus directly. Right? Jesus taught his disciples, they taught others, they taught others, they taught others, they taught others, and eventually you got saved as a result of that. I mean, I don't know, to me that's awesome. I think that's a really cool thought. But if that's the case, why, why would we then let it stop with us? Right? Why would it be like, okay, well, now we are the end of the path? Are we that um, prideful? Conceited to think that, okay, we are the final destination. We are the end of that path, right? No, that's not the way it works. No, it's not. We need to pass that on to continue discipling, continuing passing on the truth of God's word to others. And that's really why we exist as a church. Now, again, we don't know much about Timothy's father. We don't know how much he was in the picture we aren't sure if he was a Christian. We aren't sure how involved he was in his life. But it does seem likely, again, that since Paul didn't mention him in our passage in 2 Timothy, that he wasn't a Christian, or at least he wasn't someone who had much influence on passing the truth on to Timothy. But we do see, however, that Paul stepped in, and Paul acted as a spiritual father for Timothy. And he taught him and he trained him in the gospel. church, I, I hope this comes out right. I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. Every family, including my own, every family has gaps. Every family has problems. Every family has needs. And every family needs help when it comes to passing on the truth to the next generation. And that's why we're here as a church, right? To fill in those gaps, to to help single moms, to help single dads, to help broken homes or even whole homes, to help my home, to help them teach the truth of the gospel to their children and to others. Just like Paul did. I know there's a lot of you in here today, you're not parents, you're not grandparents, but neither was Paul. So who, maybe think about today, who in your life are you responsible for passing on the truth of the gospel to? Who can you mentor? Who can you disciple? Who can you take under your wing to bring them up in Christ? Something to, to think about. I won't give you the answer. That's between you and the Lord. So we see that Timothy received the faith from his family. He received it from Paul. But lastly, one thing that we need to point out um, just before, uh, just to make sure we don't get the wrong idea here, we see that the faith that Timothy had, the faith that he received, it was his own. He took it upon himself. We see that Timothy owned his own faith. Look at verse number five. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, then in thy mother Eunice, so then they passed it on to Timothy. But notice what he, Paul says. He says, and I am persuaded that in thee also. That in thee also. So we see that Paul was convinced, he was persuaded, he knew that Timothy had this authentic, real, uh, unfeigned faith in himself. So he heard the gospel from Paul. He heard the gospel from his mother. He heard the gospel from his grandmother. But he had his own faith. It wasn't Paul's faith. It wasn't his family's. It was his own. Right? He said it was authentic. He said unfeigned. It's not fake. It's not something he's pretending to have. Right? Sometimes you can, uh, uh, um, um, I, I know this happens on occasion. Right? There's, there's, there's people within a family and it's a Christian home and maybe you pretend to have that faith to please the family um, or something along those lines. But, but it wasn't a pretend faith for Timothy. It was real. It was real in his heart and in his life. He truly believed in Christ himself. And so, yes, as families, as moms, as dads, as grandparents, as friends, as a church, we are responsible to pass on the truth of the gospel to the next generation. But it is up to each and every individual to have their own faith. I know, okay, this scares me. If I can just be honest with you, I'll, I'll, I'll just be open and honest here. I, I, I sometimes have some fear when I think about this thought. You know, sometimes you hear about people who grew up as Christians. They spent time in a Christian home. They were in the church. They were involved with the church. It seems like they were a really good Christian. And then they grow up. They graduate from high school. And then they leave the faith. It happens all the time. It, it, it's, it happens a lot. And that can be disheartening. 
because you're like, you know they heard the truth. You know they had the truth of God's word that was spoken to them on a constant basis. And then you wonder like, what, what happened? And so like, like again, I, that, that causes me to, to, to fear a little bit for my own children. You know, are they going to continue, you know, in the faith? Are they um, going to continue to follow the Lord when they grow up? But I've also learned to give that over to the Lord. Because, yes, it is our responsibility. It is our job to teach them the, tr the truth. It is our responsibility to model authentic faith to them, to show them authentic faith. But ultimately, whether or not they choose Christ is between them and the Lord. And so we can look at it maybe as a, like a futile effort, like, like, is this really, you know, I'm trying so hard to teach my children about Christ. Is it even going to work? But listen, give it everything you've got. Teach your children. Model the, uh, uh, the truth of Christ to them. Model uh, what, what being a Christian is like. Mentor and disciple other people, right? Take people under your wing and, and teach them about Christ, but ultimately give them over to the Lord. And trust God with it. I would say for the children in this room, really for everyone listening, everyone here, everyone listening online, one thing we need to keep in mind is that you are responsible for your own faith. You are responsible for your own faith. Don't think that just because your parents are saved, that means you are. That's not how it works. Have you trusted Christ yourself? Have you believed on him yourself? For all of us in here, really, one thing I would say, don't put all of the burden of your discipleship and learning the gospel and learning God's word, don't put all of the burden on your pastor or the church. Because we need to take time to have your own authentic personal relationship with the Lord. Spend time with him every day in the word and in prayer. When I say burden, I don't mean like don't burden me with teaching you. That's what I'm here for. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm the pastor, right? But what I mean by that is don't, don't expect all of your discipleship, all of your learning the God's word, all of your faith to come from the pulpit. Don't expect it all to come from the church. We're here for that. We are to disciple, to learn, to teach. That is why we are here as a church. But you need to have your own faith, your own authentic faith, where you are spending time in God's word, where you are spending time in prayer, where you are, are living out and acting out the faith um, yourself as well. Take the, take the Bereans, for example. The Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Um, this is really cool. Because this kind of gives a good example of what I'm trying to say here. We'll hopefully make it make a little bit more sense. Um, Acts chapter 17 and verse 10. And so Paul and Silas, they're going through their second missionary journey. And it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by, by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Isn't that really cool what they did there? These Bereans, these people in Berea, they searched the scriptures themselves to confirm what Paul was preaching to them. Now, okay, this passage sometimes gets twisted and used in the wrong way um, to say like, oh, you should be suspicious of every pastor, of every teacher out there. You shouldn't trust anything anyone says. Um, everyone who's trying to teach you something is probably wrong. Um, we're going to use this passage to discredit the spiritual leaders out of, out of envy or whatever it is. But that's not what this passage is saying. Notice what it says. It says that they received the word with readiness of mind. They received the word from Paul and Silas. They, they, they loved to hear the word from them. They're like, oh, this is awesome. And they, 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 they received the word and, and received the truth of Jesus Christ with readiness of mind. And they were happy and ready to receive it from Paul. But then they went and searched the scriptures themselves to confirm what was said and for their own faith. They didn't just rely on their spiritual teachers or spiritual leaders to teach them. They wanted their own faith themselves. And so I think both of those elements are important. Both of them work together. Both of them are necessary. So what's the point? 
What's the point of all this? The point is, church, you, families, individuals, everyone in here, if you are a saved, born-again Christian, are responsible for passing on the truth of the gospel to the next generation. Just like Paul preached the gospel at Lystra, just like Lois and, and Eunice gave the gospel to Timothy, their son and grandson, and just as Paul discipled and mentored Timothy, we too are to teach our children and to teach others the truth of Jesus Christ. Maybe you haven't like let this sink in or let this click with you yet, but if you are a born-again Christian here this morning, if you are saved, guess what? You are a teacher. You are a discipler. You don't get the option to sit that out. So who in your life are you going to take it upon yourself to disciple and teach the truth of the gospel to? If you're a parent, hey, that, that's easy to figure out who you're going to do that for, your children. You are responsible for teaching the truth to your children. Maybe um, some of you in here know someone who's a new Christian that needs some help, needs some discipling, needs some mentoring. Maybe you have family members or friends or others that you know that need to be saved or that need to be discipled and mentored. Who can you take under your wing today? Who can you pass the truth of the gospel on to today? Now, we're not going to take the time to get into too many details about the how. You're like, well, how do I go about doing that? Well, just do what Paul did. Do what Eunice and Lois did. Spend time with them. Teach them the truth. Tell them the truth. Work with them. Model it. Be an example of living out the truth in your life. Parents, I don't mean to scare you, but I think probably all of us are already scared of this already. The world will teach your children. The world will disciple your children. They will give them all kinds of influence and teaching, whether it's through, through media or through culture um, or through things you find online or th signs you see walking through the store, whatever it is, the world will disciple your children. And so you need to spend regular time with them, praying with them and teaching them the truth. For everyone else in here, listen, get out there and spend time with people and teach them the truth of God's word. Maybe you could read a book along with somebody and talk about it. Maybe you could spend a few minutes a week praying together. Just, just do something. Now, I will say, though, as we move forward as a church through the move, um, through everything else that we're, we're doing um, as we move forward, one of the things that we will do is to uh, develop a discipleship plan to figure out how we're going to work together as a church to pass the truth on to others. That, that is coming. But don't wait for that. Start discipling and start teaching others through your natural relationships that you have now. So we'll just close with this. Moms, dads, friends, church, you are responsible for passing the truth of the gospel on to the next generation. So let's commit. Let's commit to doing that here today. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for your word. I pray that this would be a help to us, an encouragement to us. Lord, I know it's an encouragement to me something that I'm thinking about and dwelling on in my own heart, and my own life. Lord, I, I pray that you'd help me to recommit today to, to teach my children about you, to raise them up in your nurture and admonition, to be there for them, to uh, walk alongside them and, and to show them your love and your truth. Lord, I pray that as a pastor here of this church that you would help me to show your love and model it to, to everyone in this room. Um, and Lord, be committed to teach them the truth through your word. Lord, I pray that all of us this morning would commit to teaching others about you, discipling others about you and your love. Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us as a church to rally behind all of the families that we have and the children, Lord, and that we would work together to raise them up in your nurture and admonition, that, Lord, that everyone in here who, who has children, I pray that they would know that we are behind them, we are for them, we are with them. And I pray that you would encourage our hearts in this here this morning. Lord, thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are. I pray that you would just uh, work in our hearts through your word. 
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed.